Many moons ago, I interviewed the legendary Jim Keller about everything from chips to architecture to philosophy and work ethic. In that discussion, we broached the topic of which CPU architecture is better, the dominant x86 for desktops and servers, the dominant ARM in smartphones, or the upcoming RISC-V open source architecture. Well, I'm here at his new company, TensTorrent, to find out about their new high-performance RISC-V core in their upcoming line of processors. So RISC-V is an architecture that is being heralded as the open source architecture usable by all. Some of the first companies to pick up the mantle include Western Digital, who use it inside their storage controllers, Andes Technology, who has created a series of 32-bit cores, and Codasip, with a range of low-powered embedded microcontrollers. However, most of what RISC-V has initially been designed to tackle has been that low-end microcontroller market. Companies in this space either made a custom controller or bought one from the custom microcontroller market, or even a Cortex-M based design from ARM. Now they can leverage the academic focus of the RISC-V open source design, and we already have open source cores from Berkeley, ETH Zurich, and others. The idea of RISC-V is that an open source instruction set could be used by academia and business alike, and deployable without royalties. That has led to a boom in designs for the microcontroller and embedded market, where something unique and custom to a situation is the standard use model, without having to pay those royalties to a company like ARM. RISC-V has found a home in that embedded market, and reports say that up to 10 billion RISC-V cores have already been sold commercially. One question, however, hanging over the development of this new technology is its ability to scale. Is the instruction set robust enough to scale from microcontrollers through to consumer products and then to enterprise performance levels. For a long time, this has been an unknown. Now there is precedent here. The ARM ecosystem has also had this question. ARM has consistently sat in the low end performance market for smartphones and sold billions of cores before we actually saw high performance integration into laptops and PCs by companies like Apple and Qualcomm. Perhaps in future, we'll also see a socketed design in desktop as well. But ARM has showcased enterprise level core designs deployed by Amazon and Ampere today. But can RISC-V do the same? We put in RISC-V in our next generation chip, which we're taking out soon, part because we went and asked the other vendors to add some floating point formats for us, AI. So we're keen on AI floating point formats, accuracy, precision, stuff and AI programs have to be because you want to drive the small floating point data sizes but maintain the accuracy across you know billions of operations and the RISC-V guy said sure. The basic building block of a modern core takes an instruction with operands, decodes it, executes it and retires that instruction. RISC-V describes the input language but a modern core uses microcode for how it works internally. For performance, we then layer on smart prefetches, caches, buffers, and work to extract more work per instruction, designing the core to smartly take more data, process it in an order optimized for performance, and then manipulate that result. The more you add to a modern core to improve performance, the more power it can consume, and the more transistors it takes to build. As a result of all this, it's easy to focus on small core designs that are low in power first. However, the architecture also has to be able to support high throughput and high bandwidth capabilities. Insert TensTorrent solution. Let's have some initial pretext here. TensTorrent is nominally an AI hardware semiconductor company. Their goal is to create hardware to help accelerate machine learning code with various targets in mind. Part of the difficulty in doing that is predicting what types of machine learning codes will be relevant two or three years ahead of time. For example, the hardware requirements of modern transformer networks are vastly different to the machine learning problems back in 2020. Now this is their first product, Grayskull. It's a big chip with some basic CPU control and lots of compute paired with LPDDR4. This is two of their second generation chip, Wormhole, on a PCIe card. This is production, takes advantage of a denser core design, GDDR6, and built-in Ethernet for networking. Beyond this, the future third generation is Black Hole and replaces those basic CPUs with Sci-5's X280 RISC-V vector processing cores, again with a low-powered memory interface. On top of that, it can also enable chiplets. And that leads us to our fourth generation, 
Grendel, which is a multi-chiplet design taking one of those third generation black hole chiplets and pairing it with a dedicated custom RISC-V chiplet for extra processing. This is Tense Torrent's new custom core called Ascalon. There's gonna be 128 of them. Tense Torrent has realized that modern machine learning techniques aren't simply a question of throwing lots of compute at a problem with SIMD engines. Machine learning has evolved that within a lot of those matrix matrix calculations, additional linear and vector calculations are needed between the machine learning layers to help make determinations for the future of that data. Normally, we might consider farming that process off, off of the GPU back to the CPU, but that ends up being slow and costly in terms of both performance and power. So for in order to scale, there has to be a proper CPU core right next to those matrix cores, as well as a fair amount of memory. While here at Tens Torrent, I sat down with their chief RISC-V architect, Wei Han Lian, to discuss the need for large compute core designs in modern machine learning networks. Wei Han here has been at Tens Torrent for 18 months, having previously been lead architect on Apple's M1 series of processors. If everybody knows how to do high performance, it's probably him. Uh, yeah, my name is uh, Wei Han Lian. So I'm chief CPU architect here in Tens Torrent. Um, I think ARM is a great architecture, right? So, uh, when I joined Tensor, um, Gene recruited me to do like investigation to find a companion CPU IP for AI application, right? So I look on a couple um, IP offer from different company, and there's a specific data type we actually want, right? For certain application, AI application we want to support. We I went to ARM, and they say no, right? We cannot support it. You have to be like version nine of the ARM spec, right? Or, or even ARM version ten. They cannot just flexible support arbitrary something you want. And then when to sci-fi, they say yes. Right? That's why one of the reasons we're choosing the sci-fi process as our companion CPU IP. But when we start deciding to develop our own CPU IP for high performance, we want higher performance. And risk is the obvious choice because you become their membership, right? They give you a solid foundation of the spec ISA definition then you can build any performance level for any application, for any product you want without any license negotiation. You also have the flexibility to introduce your specialized ISA in there, right? So it just give you the freedom of the, the freedom to innovate based on a very solid, you know, architectural foundation. So I think that's really a great, great specification to go to design our CPU, yeah. Um, so Ascalon is probably the first AY right, decode processor in the RISC-V world. That's what I believe. Right? So, so when you talk about the width of the machine, right, that in general, you can compare that to the car cylinder. The wider the width of the machine, the more horsepower you have. Right? But of course, that comes with the cost of the overhead, and the hardware, and power consumption, and also design complexity. Right? So, we actually aim for a server grade processor, right? Because that's the target we're actually going after. But at the same time, we actually design, ensure that the design can be scaled to six Y design, four Y design, and two Y design, two Y design processor to going after the market with a different PPA we want to go after. If you're going looking on 10, 10 store and 10 six, right? Um, accelerator is actually a quite scalable architecture. Right. So if you believe, envision that AI will be everywhere, right, which is what we are believing, we can actually, using our scalable architecture to go into the client space, right, to the edge server, to the cloud server, and to the, even the HPC market we want to go after. So our roadmap on the CPU side actually matches that vision quite well, right? So our 2Y design can go to client space, right? Our AY design can go into like HPC or cloud server space. So this product strategy is actually mapping well to the company vision quite well. Right? Well, because uh, we believe that a good machine learning architecture is a scalable architecture, and they should be able to use it both in the training and also in the inference. Of course, the inference in general has their power consumption right, requirement. But our process architecture, if we actually choose the implementation method, right? Because implementation based on the transistor and based on the gate sizing, right? You can actually build a very power efficient design. But our architecture is actually enabled to be scalable to go into any market, like inference market or training market, like, and it's being envisioned by the founder when they started this company. So it's designing? Um, I, th I think that probably leads uh, Jim to decide, right? So we would love to, right? 
but uh, uh, due to the competitive reason, right, we probably would not do that. But in the future, when the product is introduced, right, we should introduce more like uh, specification or detail for our macro architecture. Yeah, definitely. Just for you, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> My hand's description of a scalable core is going to be paramount to tense torrents execution. The Ascalon core is an 8-wide decode, 10-wide issue core with 13 execution ports, including 6 integer units, 3 load store units, 2 floating point units, and 2 vector units. There is support for atomic instructions, as well as int8, fp16, fp32, and fp64 data types. It also has a full set of L1, L2, and L3 caches, way predictors, and a Tage branch predictor. If you want to deeper dive into this core and their cluster microarchitecture, leave a comment down below and we'll make sure this happens. So this is the big Ascalon core for Grendel, which Tens Torrent has earmarked for server and HPC, but it's also earmarked for laptop. And that's not all. Tens Torrent has also designed derivatives of this core. There are a total of five, and here's that range. At the bottom left, we have the open source Sonic Boom RISC-V processor. And at the top to the right is the high performance eight wide Ascalon. Between the two, there's the six wide Allosaur for client and edge, and then four wide, three wide, and two wide versions, which are die size and power optimized for individual use cases. The reason why Tense Tyrant has five designs here is because they're going to be using chiplets. And it seems perhaps not just for AI chips. I think I think you have to go to a chip that right. So there's a one particular reason that that uh, people probably forgot in the arguments that for given the I/O capacity you want to go right, and also you know the future process technology right. In general, you have smaller die area. That's mean the uh, beachfront area for the die is actually smaller and smaller. But the problem you want more I/O bandwidth for that. And also the I/O bandwidth going to the I/O pad, they are not shrinking, right? Because there's a physical requirement you have to support. So transfer the size had to be certain large enough to drive that, right? So then you are running out of the beach farm area, right? So the only way you can do is actually putting the die to die and creating a specific like I/O IP surrounding it, so you can expand that footprint. So you have to go for that, right? That's one must thing you have to do. And secondly, is that it provides you that flexibility, right? So your IP now can be used to compose any system. If you actually see and design your IP really well beforehand, has that vision about how to use it. So your interface has to be clean and portable. You have to provide sufficient bandwidth so they can scalable to any kind of design, right? But just like back to my first point, right? I, I, I certainly believe that you have to do that. It's not the choice you have because for the computation power you have, you have to funnel all the possible data in there. You need that bandwidth. And for that bandwidth, right, you need the IO pad, and then IO pad cannot fit in on the beach run area. Then you have to go for chiplet solution. So while I'm here, I've bumped into somebody really special. You may have heard in the news that Jim Keller recently switched roles at Tennis Torrent internally from CTO to CEO. And I managed to book some time to ask him a few questions. At what, at what point will you be drinking your own Kool-Aid using Tense Torrent hardware to develop future Tense Torrent hardware? Uh, soon. Soon. So everybody, everybody on the planet is aware of GPT, chat GPT now, and GitHub Pilot. So GitHub Pilot's been out for a while. It helps people write code. I've asked our engineers to start using that. Some of them think it's ridiculously good for helping you on the easy code. Andre Carpathy said it, it writes 80% of his code 80% correct, which if you're familiar with programmers, yep. is not a bad yeah. line. Yeah. You'd like to be 90-90, um, but it'll get there. It's pretty young. Uh, a woman in our HR group used it to write some HR policies to chat GPT. She said it was really funny, and it's pretty good. Um, this so, guy over there has written some social posts, yeah. <laughs> assisted. Yeah, so what I think, so, so we're, you start to use it in general. It's, mm. it's going to be part of the toolkit. It's very obvious it's going to be good at writing test bench and structures. And we're thinking about, all right, so we have a methodology about how to build and test hardware and build and test software. And you typically build frameworks so that supports all the tests, and then the tests are easy to generate, and they have you know, widgets in them that check. So now can we train the model so it knows about our framework and those widgets so it can auto-generate tests? That's 
That's a fairly obvious task, but it's, it's engineering work to do. Um, we think it's going to be able to generate RTL. And then it's going to start to generate code that's different from how humans write code. And then this is the, this is the thing, and this is you know, my bad. It's one that every once in a while you see these things and you go, I can't unsee it. The AI code generation is going to make programs that are different from people, and the computers that accelerate that the best are going to be different than the ones we built today. So us having really solid AI foundation, hardware computers, and CPUs means that as we figure that out, we're going to go build new computers that are better at running that software. And that's a positive feedback loop. And because we have the capability to do AI hardware software and CPUs with all the collateral that goes around that with the team using AI to do it, we think we're going to be, let's say, well positioned to go make those next architectural steps. And that's, that's a fairly big intellectual statement. Mm. And we're getting into it, and as best I can tell, you know, like Lubisha and I've talked a lot about this in the last two years, and as we've sort of gotten into it, it seems like we're directionally correct and we're going to keep going. Does it worry you that the output, the initial outputs of those models create designs that are uninterpretable? So, Not so when it comes really. to debugging or edge cases, you can't actually go in, it's yeah. just... So, so this is one of the arguments, like in autonomous driving, don't you want some part of the code to be written by humans, right? Because you could audit it. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, really? You have five million lines of code written by 100 people over five years, most of whom no longer work at your company, and you think that's auditable. It's not. With AI, this is the really funny thing. If you have a good data set and you have good train, training, you can actually train it to a loss function. You have a known loss function, right? The weird thing about the big C program is it doesn't have a loss function. You have no idea where its sharp edges are, where its complete failures are. Yeah, right. That's fair. You know how long did they ship Windows and everybody's using it? Blue screens on a regular basis, right? <laughs> You've been using so that that's the auditable yeah. software that you know you think AI is like inferior to. Well, this so, is so this is you know. And then the other, the other mysterious thing is the people who wrote the code, human beings, they also appear to mostly have intelligence, and they're not auditable either. So everyone has a different definition of high performance. In my mind, that's something that can perform well in single-threaded tasks, like a modern desktop or laptop. TSMC says it's anything above a smartphone, and that includes servers. I suspect the true answer might be something in the middle, especially as even base enterprise CPUs are now coming out in 128 core or more designs. TensTorrent's Ascalon cores inside its Grendel product are meant to scale to 128 cores in a chiplet paired with memory chiplets and machine learning chiplets. This is indicating that TensTorrent isn't simply thinking about machine learning accelerators, but also the hosts as well. With that super large eight wide issue microarchitecture and 128 cores multiplying that performance, when TenTorrent slides talk about multi-core chiplets in server, laptop, client, and HPC, it's an important sign that we are moving into the true high performance RISC-V era. Many thanks to TenTorrent for inviting me into the Santa Clara headquarters to see the work they're doing. And if you're interested in more content like this or more content on TenTorrent, let me know in the comments below.